All right, if you're in James chapter 4, we'll pick right up with it, and so let's, uh, let's read it together. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James has been building to this point his argument. <clears throat> He's been uh, hinting towards some of the big problems that are in these churches that he writes to uh, that are going on by, by speaking of these problems earlier in chapter 2 and chapter 3 in particular. He's talking about things going on with partiality, the problem of the tongue, and how it, it causes all sorts of evil. Now he, he gets specific and says, these are the things that you are doing with the sins that I've been mentioning. And so he, he starts off with a question and tells us what the origin of trouble is uh, for all of them, and he says, what, are, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? He says, is it not that, this, that your passions are at war within you? And so, what is it? it it's the self. It's, it's worrying about oneself. The origin of trouble is, is, is worrying about yourself, even when you know that you shouldn't be. Putting yourself first when you know you shouldn't, and so it's, it's going for that kind of, of life where it's just more stuff, more for me, all the time. And, and what he gets to is, is saying that living for the pleasure of oneself actually is what works misery into one's life. It, it, it seems counterintuitive, but this is exactly what he, he's making the argument for and giving proofs for, is saying that the more you worry about yourself, the more miserable you're going to be. And this in no way comes to any end, and it actually not only just makes you miserable, but it will make the people around you miserable, because you will be finding yourself in fights and quarrels, jealousy, problems that go on with it. And he, gives, he gets very specific into where these things will go. And so he gives us then the pathology, how, how this works its way out, what it will come from. And he says that in telling us then, you desire and do not have, so you murder, and so you you want to stop right there and you're like, wait a minute, that, that's a bit of an exaggeration, right? I mean, if I don't get what I want for Christmas or for my birthday or if I can't afford something, I'm not going to go and kill somebody. Well, maybe, maybe not, but, but actually we already know of an example of this happening, right? I mean, David wants Bathsheba. She's not his. And Uriah ends up getting killed because of what it is that he wants. And this indeed happens. And it happens more frequently than we even want to give credit to it for. And so he goes with it, you covet and you cannot obtain. The desire for more personal pleasure and enjoyment is this problem, paradoxically, that leads to more strife and not relaxation or peace. And so that we find, as we think about this ourselves, I mean, we're inundated now. You can sit on your phone in your house all day long if you want, looking up stuff 
Like, you, you know, you used to have to at least drive somewhere. You'd get a catalog, and after you'd look through the catalog, you'd seen it all, and you'd be done. Or you'd have to go to the mall, or you'd have to do that. Now you can just sit on Amazon, on your phone, or get emails from all the different places that tell you about all the wonderful deals that exist out there everywhere, and you can want things that you didn't even know existed until you sat down on your phone. I mean, it's, un it's crazy. How much, I mean, I, if you think back just like 20 years ago, if, you're, if your 20-year-ago person could believe what it is that you're able to do now and how it is you're able to shop, you wouldn't have believed yourself. I mean, it's just nuts. But as this goes, what, what happens? Does it ever bring you satisfaction? Do you say, today's the last day I'm ever going to have to buy anything because after this, I am done. I'm happy. I'm good. I mean, right? I mean, I'm future-proofed until the next version comes out, right? Or until my neighbor or my best friend or whoever got the thing that was a little bit better than the one I got, and they call me on the phone to remind me of that. And they send me pictures of it, and then I see their kids playing with it, and they went on an extra vacation, and I didn't go on one, right? And the more we worry about it, it leads to more frustration, doesn't it? And so then all of a sudden, the thing that was the latest, the greatest, the best that you've ever seen a few months later, it's not, and you're bored with it. And so, like I said, somebody else has something better, and then you're sitting there, and you're not satisfied, and you're really frustrated. And now you're not just frustrated with yourself because that's no fun. It's got to be somebody else's fault, right? I mean, you've got to sit there and go, well, somebody else, if they hadn't have bought that, I'd be happy with what I had, Right? No. John McMurray put it very succinctly when he said the best cure for hedonism is an attempt to practice it. It's an attempt to practice it. The more that you get into it, the deeper you go, the worse you feel. And, and it's, it's a spiral because James is, is going to keep building as we go through this chapter. It's a, it's, a, it's a downward spiral. As these things go, you keep finding yourself deeper and deeper in the hole. And in turn, then you find yourself farther and farther away from God. And so his main concern at this point is that it's causing fights amongst people in the church because what happens? Instead of people in the church wanting to go and serve that that comes because we're united through Christ, instead we're all looking then to serve ourselves. And he sees this in the church. So the thing that brings us all together is Jesus. The other, if Jesus is out of the picture, we're, you know, we're 135 people in a room ready to kill each other. Because each one of us is going to want something different or is going to want something that somebody else has. Jesus is the thing that is the uniter of us all. And so once he is no longer our focus, our focus is ourself, fight is the natural thing that's going to come out of it. And the, all, the next thing that follows with that then is that when you have this trouble, you become prayerless. And so it's this prayerlessness that comes from this trouble that we have, and he says in verse, <clears throat> at the end of verse 2, then he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so when our, our minds are focused upon ourselves and our desires, one of the two things that happens is, is we become prayerless. Why? Why does that happen? Well, when we're focused on ourselves, if we are believers, there's something that we know. We know we can't go to God with the requests that are on our heart because we know we shouldn't be having those requests. We know it. And so what happens in one day turns into two, turns into a week, turns into a month, turns into a year that you, the last time you ever spoke to God about anything because you're like, I can't go to him because the things that I want, I shouldn't want. They're eating me up, they're tearing me up, but it doesn't matter. I, I can't do this. And so we just don't go to God at all. But on the other hand, we may actually express our wrongful desires, and then we'll get frustrated because God doesn't give them to us, right? I mean, my neighbor got a brand new car. I started praying for a brand new car, right? I mean, or maybe I'd need two because he got one. God, give it to me. Bought this lottery ticket. It ought to win. I mean, you're in control of the numbers, Lord, you know, right? And what happens with that? Because, too, we're not concerned of anything of what it is that God has to say. We're just concerned about ourselves, and we're hoping that he's the magic genie that's going to answer, give us our wish. There was a, a member of British Parliament uh, at the end of the 1800s. A, a prayer was found that he wrote after he died. And the prayer said this. It said, O oh Lord, 
Thou knowest that I have mine estates in the city of London, and likewise that I have lately purchased an estate in the county of Essex. I beseech thee to preserve the two counties of Middlesex and Essex from fire and earthquake, as I have a mortgage in Hertfordshire. I beg of thee likewise to have an eye of compassion on that county. As for the rest of the counties, thou mayest deal with them as thou art pleased. <laughs> I mean, right? Lord, I'm sure somebody deserves punishment for something wrong they've done. Just don't have it be me. And don't have that punishment that's dealt out to those people have any effect upon anything that I'm involved in. Otherwise, do as you please. And so it seems to go against, right, with the psalmist writes in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is what he says. He, he says you ask and you don't receive because what you're asking for is selfish. It's all about you. Or when you do, or when you don't ask anything because you know it's wrong. But then he says what? You ask wrongly. Where's your desire? Where's your heart? You know, the, the surest fire way to find out where your heart is is in any, any given day, allow yourself a moment, you know, like if your watch beeps and tell you like to breathe or have some moment, you know, like these, all these apps now, they're telling you how you free your mind from nonsense. But give yourself like a minute to think. And if your mind is left to not have to go anywhere in particular, you get to decide where your mind goes. What's the first thing it pops on? What's the first thing it goes to? Chances are that's where your heart is. And chances are, if the first thing that it pops to is something consistent over time, and it's a point of frustration for you as well, then you might, you might have just also found your idol. We don't have to look hard, and it's one of the reasons that everyone in the room, we don't seek silence and solitude, especially not for long. We like noise because it keeps us from having to think and be honest with who we are, and therefore as well, who God is. But when our heart is upon anything else in this world other than God, we will not be delighted, we'll be frustrated, we will have anger with our brothers and sisters here at church, we'll be angry with everybody, nothing in life will ever be satisfying, we'll be bitter, we'll be prayerless, and we won't want anything to do with God. And so then this leaves us like in this bad spot like how does God then regard our rebellion and then what is what will anything will he do to help us brings us to the next one and he's going to thankfully he's going to give us more grace but in, the, in seeing this we're going to see though that God is hostile to what it is that we're doing look at verse 4 and he says you adulterous people do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God well, we know this. Jesus has talked about this, right? Where he tells us that you can't have two masters. You serve one, you'll hate the other. Or you'll serve the other one and hate the first one, but you can't serve them both. And so if your heart is after anything other than God, or you claim that your heart is with God and with something else, he's saying, no, it cannot be. And so it's a painful thought for us to think that actually we would be an enemy of God. I mean, this is, he, he puts this so... Bluntly, that you would be in direct contradiction with God. And so he gets right to the heart of this, saying, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And it begins to hearken back to what the Apostle Paul writes back in Philippians chapter 3. And he tells us in this same vein of how it is that becoming enemies of, of, of the Lord in our hearts being shared between different things. And in chapter 3, verse 18 of Philippians, he says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he puts it bluntly, he says, question your salvation. He's saying, question your salvation. How can you say that you love God and yet be adversarial to him? How can you love God and not love what he says? 
If you don't love what God says, and everything that God says comes from his character, he's not like us where we say things and do something different. What he says is who he is. So if we don't love what he says, do we love who he is? Are we better friends with the world? Or are we better friends with Jesus than we were a year ago? Do you give yourself time to think? Is this the case? Have we done anything to better ourselves in the year towards how, how we know God, how we follow God? What we, do we pray more? Do we pray more for others? Are we more selfless? It was one of the most poignant words I heard in, in at least the last year was at a funeral that I went to and person after person after person got up at the funeral saying he never had time for himself. He never gave time to himself. He always had time for everybody else. He never thought of himself. And thousands of people there were, because that was the truth. And so that we see that this life of thinking only of ourself brings not only hostility of God, but it brings the jealousy of God. In verse 5, it says, Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? When, we're, when we become believers, we, we know that God has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts, to renew us, to take our heart of stone and make it into a heart of flesh, as he tells us back in Ezekiel chapter 37. He makes us new creations, as Jesus discusses with Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, he makes us something different and he dwells inside of us. And so if we indeed do believe and we love God and we behave this way, it pains the spirit that he's placed inside of us and therefore it pains our conscience. You live as someone who is constantly torn. And people who are constantly torn, again, aren't happy people. They're miserable. Because you know the thing that you should be doing, but you refuse to do it and continue then to pursue harder the very thing that's making you miserable. And God is clear numerous times in his word that how he will never, ever, ever share our affections with anyone else. His jealousy requires that we are to desire him as faithfully as he has pursued us. He has every right to do so and every right to request it of us. But then we feel the weight of this. And this is what James wants. You feel burdened because if you're honest with yourself, as you sit there, you think, you go, I've got this problem. <laughs> I have a, you know, a split personality on what it is that I know I'm supposed to want versus that which I actually pursue. I know what I'm supposed to love and how I'm supposed to talk, and I know what it is that I do. And when you feel the weight... And so thankfully then, verse 6 then comes with the grace of God, but he gives more grace. And we just stop there for a second, but he gives more grace. In other words, he's already given grace, right? Jesus is the greatest grace in which that he's given to us. His death, receiving God's just punishment for all that we've done wrong, but he says he gives more, Augustine once said, the early church father said, God gives what he demands. God gives what he demands. What does he demand from us? Perfect obedience. Not a jot or a tittle of the law will ever fall away until it is completed, right? It's fulfilled. He demands a human that is made in his image to love perfectly, to obey perfectly. And what's he do? Because it's not us. He sends Jesus. And so the comfort to the believer then is that there is always greater grace for the believer. There's always greater grace. Ask for grace and it will come. He says then in verse 6, Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He will give it if you ask. But what's the problem? To go to God in prayer and to ask is to admit that you have a need. It's to admit that you have a problem. It's to admit that you can't fix your own life. It's an admission of saying that I am screwed up, I'm a hot mess, and I need help because I can't do anything about it. That's a hard thing to do, and that is what is required of us, right? Is to be humble because to ask God is to admit this lacking. But it says that he gives grace 
to the humble. One time, Charles Spurgeon told of a story that he had a woman that came up to him uh, one day after he was preaching, and she said, I pray for you every day that you may be kept humble. And she was a wonderfully fine-looking woman. She was splendidly dressed. And Spurgeon replied, Thank you so much, but you remind me of a failure in my duty. I have never prayed for you that you might be kept humble. (laughs) Dear sir, she cried, there is no need for such prayers, for I am not tempted to be proud. Spurgeon then wryly replied, how proud she was to have obtained such a delusion. (laughs) We're always able to find it in everybody else, aren't we? And so this is, this is the problem. The problem is, is that we know that humility is needed, but we just pray for everybody else to be humble. Then if everybody else is humble, they might notice how great we are. But this isn't what he says. He says God opposes the proud. Remember, go back. You, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. You ask proudly. You ask because you think it's owed to you. But it says he gives grace to those who are humble. And so then he tells us, though, to submit. He says, therefore, since grace comes to those who are humble, the obvious next thing to tell us to do is to submit. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We all have within us a desire, do we not, that that we want to be remembered. Nobody wants to be the person that nobody ever knows their name, right? That that did nothing with their life. And we want desperately for people to notice, I mean, this this is like, I mean, the genius behind Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all this is we want to be noticed, right? We want to be noticed for the most mundane of things, Right? Things that you didn't know about people 20 years ago that you weren't asking questions about people 20 years ago. Not only do you know them, you know them in such intimate detail, you might as well have been in their house when they happened, right? It's insane. But we love being noticed. But the problem is, in, making, in this desire to make a name for ourselves and a desire to be known, is that we take the gifts that God has given us that indeed may attract attention from other people because they are gifts, they are things that are worthy of renown, but instead of pointing to God, they point to ourselves. And the problem is, as with all gifts, whether they be physical gifts that people give to you or they are gifts as in talents or things that you have that have been gifted to you, is that they're never enough if that's the focus and someone else always is a little better or has a little more than what you've got, right? Right? There's always somebody who's, who can run faster, jump higher, think faster, do something a little bit better. And so when that is the source of your satisfaction, it ultimately leaves you lacking. And so what does he say? He says, to submit to God, the devil will then flee, draw near to him. Well, how do we draw near? Well, remember, a prayerless person is somebody who's thinking about themselves. So here, a prayerless person... A prayerful person is this person who draws near. Prayer is the thought, is the thing that is the soul's desire to draw near to God. Prayer is a desire to be more like Him who made us and to be with Him as well. And a realization that the only way that we can ever have any satisfaction in this life or the next is for it to come from Him. Prayer is an admission of this. Lack of a prayer life is a showing, usually, of a lack of an understanding of this. But he tells us not just to stop there, but he tells us to keep going. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. He tells us again, reminding us that we are to run from these things that cause all of these problems in our lives, that cause all these problems in the church, that we're to run from them. He's reminding us again that we cannot serve to masters, and he's reminding us as well that when we repent, that we can prepare ourselves for more grace. Repentance will always lead to more grace. 
But then in this section, he, he leaves us with a reminder that we are to grieve and then we're to change. And in this grieving and change, we're to mourn for sin. Jesus tells us in the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are those who mourn. We're to mourn for sin and to mourn for the sin of others. And we're to mourn for what sin causes in this world. When we see brokenness, when we see hurt, when we see harm that, cause, that is happening to fellow human beings, our hearts should break. It's not funny. It's not giving them what they deserve. It's not like, finally, I've waited for these people to get what was coming to them for forever. Do we mourn? Are, are we wrecked by the pain that it causes to people? You know, it's always interesting when I was doing work overseas that we, we could always find people to give money, to pray, and to help all the uh, mothers and children that had been just destroyed by AIDS in Africa. And I, I remember asking one time when we were having this same problem with, with single mothers that we were needing to help at our church in Lexington and asking around, how, how do you think those women got AIDS? You're so willing to help them. Well, why won't you help the single mothers here? Why? Oh, because you know their story. I see. And because you know their story, all of a sudden they're not deserving of any grace. But the women who live 5,000 miles away, that you don't have anything to, you don't know anything about them, therefore you feel sorry for them. Why are we not wrecked for the, why are we not wrecked with pain for the people who are near to us? Why are we not wrecked with the cost that was paid to repair the damage that has been done by sin? And so James tells us, be wrecked by this, be destroyed, mourn, weep, and then sin no more, right? Move on, humble yourselves before the Lord. Humility and selflessness will bring satisfaction from God. And so then he reminds us as we go forward then to be careful with what it is that we say. Be careful with our words. Avoid all speech, whether true or false, that runs down another person. He's not just speaking here where he says, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. In some translations, he'll say he who slanders. Well, of course, lying about somebody is something wrong, but he's actually saying, Something heavier than that, he's saying, actually, if you know something that might be true about this person, and the only reason that you continue to go on and spread that thing that is true is because you like to see the misery that it brings, how's that any better? It's passing along information that you know that is damaging, even if it's true, but because you like the damage that it causes. It makes you feel better about yourself. Fault finding is not a spiritual gift. And if before we have a problem going, well, I always just tell the truth no matter what. Well, okay, that's great. But here's some, here's some issues where you won't tell the truth. Like, for example, right, the classic, if you had Jews in the basement, right, and Nazis are on your door, you're not telling them you got Jews in the basement. Why? They don't deserve the truth. And there's a lot of things that are true about people that just don't need to be made publicly. It's not necessarily a sinful thing. It's just not any of anybody else's business. And you just want to tell it because you like to change people's perception of this person. Satisfaction of harming someone else's reputation because you'd like to see them suffer. Saying things to others in a mean-spirited way because you, you feel smug in your own condemnation of them. He, he says that not only are these things terrible, but he's going to say that these things are kind of the worst and we're like oh wait a minute though no, there's so many things that are worse but he's actually going to say really kind of not because what does he say that this causes he says first it causes self-justification above the law In verse 11 where he's telling us this he says the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law how is this when you find others guilty of breaking the law and you don't see this in yourself, it places you, what, outside and above the law. So therefore, what? You're a judge of the law. You're the one who gets to make the determinations of when and where it's applied and how. And of course, that's never on oneself. It's always on somebody else. And so in effect, then placing yourself above it not only places you then above the law, but then self-justification above God himself because he's the lawgiver. 
Verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, and he's, he's, he, you know, just to cut to the chase, he's saying it's not you. <laughs> he says it's he who is able to save and to destroy. And notice that he puts both things in there. He says he's able to save and to destroy. To remember what? God has the omnipotent power, right? He, he has all the ability. Run to him humbly. Run. Admit your faults. He forgives you. He's so full of grace. Run from him in your pride. He will destroy you. Don't forget. James tells it very clearly. And so then he asks the question, but who are you to judge your neighbor? He says, God's the judge. Who is the one that is the ultimate, ultimate arbiter between who is going to be in heaven and hell? It's not anyone sitting in this room. Who in here knows truly what's inside anyone else's heart? Nobody in this room. We place these things upon God. God is the only judge. And if we were to think that this is some sort of a minor problem, remember that this tiny problem went on in a garden towards the beginning of this book where you know, two people were sitting in it and they thought for a minute, you know what, I think I know better than God does how things need to be done. I can judge between good and evil just as good as he can. And that turned out all right, didn't it? Our ignorance is so ignorant that we realistically think we can take God's place in judgment. I mean, that's pretty bad when you're that ignorant, right? So this isn't a compliment to any of us. Judgmentalism, then, is this terrible sin. I mean, what worse things can you do than to elevate yourself above the law and above the lawgiver? The only thing worse would be to do those things and then to deny that you do them. And so as Peter says in 1 Peter 2.23, entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly. And so in our last section then, it says, he tells us then more so how it is that we're to go about then conducting day-to-day -day life. And so he starts off by telling us kind of what not to say. Never say these things, Right? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit. How many of us claim, claim a belief in God, but conduct our lives no differently from an unbeliever? In other words, if, you know, everybody's got cameras now anyway, so it might as well be getting spied upon. If, if there were cameras watching us the entire day and you were to take, you know, unbeliever A and then person who says that they're believer B and watch them for an entire week, would, you, would anybody tell the difference? And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing like, you know, criminal things, but just are your judgments are the way that you speak to your family, speak to your children, choose to use your time, choose to decide how you'll do your business, what you will do with your business, how you will pursue what it is that will come for you in the future. Would any of these things look any different from anybody who's not sitting here tonight? How we purchase our homes, go about our careers, sports, raise children. Do any of them come with any reference whatsoever to the will of God? Or is it one of those things where we've separated what we think is the sacred and the secular, and we say we choose careers, family direction, money, whatever, on our own? That has nothing to do with God. And so we live in such a way where we do as we please while we say that we love God. And it becomes a problem. And this is what he's asking. He says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? So you can make these absolute statements of what it is that you're supposed to go and do, and yet you don't even know what's about to come. You have no idea what tomorrow brings. How many people have had like one of those cat catastrophic big moments in their life, and as it's happening, saying, I can't believe this is happening. I never saw this coming. I never thought this was going to happen. And then, you just, and then you have that moment finally where peace comes, and you go, this time yesterday, none of this was going on. This time yesterday, I was ignorant of every last bit of everything that has just happened to me. And yet your life is completely different 24 hours later, and you didn't know. Are we so entrenched in the culture that is around us that we cannot believe that God wouldn't give us everything that the culture claims we need? Do we encourage our children to do that which is difficult despite the costs? Do we choose things that is 
discernibly different from the way a non-believer would choose to do things? Do we claim to love God but live as practical, pragmatic atheists? Do any of our decisions get colored by the fact that we claim to know that there is a God who has revealed himself and not only has he revealed himself but that he is constantly with his people and he loves his people to such an extent that he has given his son and his son's life on behalf of ours that we may be returned to him? Do we live as though that that's true? So we who have no idea what tomorrow brings then operate in the ignorance of the one who brings about tomorrow. We don't have any idea of what tomorrow brings. And as James has been making this argument through the chapter, then as you operate in this form, you tend to become prayerless, you tend to step away from God, and then you tend to worry more about what's going to happen tomorrow because you're more worried about your things, you're more worried about what you might get, you're more worried about how much money you make, what decisions your children are going to to make, where they're going to live, where they're going to go, everything that's going to happen. And so therefore, you've removed yourself from the one who brings tomorrow about to rely upon yourself who is completely ignorant of what's about to occur. We should know better. Psalm 90, 12 says, Oh, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We are ignorantly arrogant when we boast of what tomorrow will bring. Thinking that things come from our brains, our time, our plans, our energy, it's a lie and it's an amazing arrogance that all of us have. And even if you can go, I can point to every single solitary one of those things. That's great. I'm glad you can, but who gave any of it to you? You didn't ask for it. It's not like there was a checklist that you got to fill out before you were born and you chose the things that were given to you. And so what must we say? In the Latin, it's uh, it's Deo Valenti, if the Lord wills, if God wills. That's what he says. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. We know better when we fail to act upon this knowledge. We know it. We know that life is short. We know we have no control over its brevity. Others may live as though God does not exist, but we should know better. We know that we're nothing but mist. We know we're nothing but vapors. This is not something that any Christian should be ignorant of. And so the thing that brings us, that brings us peace is when we, we know that he who has shown us immeasurable grace every day and whose grace was great enough to give us his son in our stead to receive the judgment of our sin, that he has tomorrow already in his hand. And if he's loved you enough to give you Jesus, he's loved you enough to take you through whatever it is that comes next. So know the good that you should do and be satisfied with whatever comes. Just because you go and do good doesn't mean that good is always going to happen to you. That's not the deal. The deal is be faithful and trust God with the results. So trust yourself to Deo Valentis. Trust yourself to if the Lord wills, if God wills, whatever he brings about, I'm okay with. Leave you with this short story. In in 1744, Louis XV was taking the throne and the people of of France were sick of Louis XIV, the the sun king that lived for so long. He had oppressed them and they they were hopeful in this very young man who had taken over the throne and that he would be different. And so when he was young, he was smitten with a malady. He was smitten with a sickness that threatened to cut his day short. And so that all of France, all of Paris, everyone was in terror with the thought that that this king who held all this potential may die at a young age. And so the the prayers of the priests, of of the people, they went to church. The church bells would ring and the whole country was praying and sobbing. And, the ten, and tender interest and deep affection for Louis the Fifteenth. So that this name they named him Louis the Well Beloved. The love of the people, though, at this point was not inspired by what he had done, but what it is that they were hoping he would do. They had been crushed under the heel of a brutal tyrant, and they loved him because all of their hope was in him to do better. Thirty years later, Louis the Fifteenth made it that far. Thirty years later, he lay sick, but none of the churches resounded with excessive groanings. Sobs did not interrupt any prayers, for no prayers were being offered. In fact, Louis the Well-Beloved had become the most hated man in France. In 1744, he might have done well to have asked, what have I done to be so loved? And therefore, in 17, 
74, what have I done to be so hated? And the truth is he'd done the same in both instances. He had done nothing. May this never be for any of our lives, and may we take what James has to say to heart here. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we know, Lord, that it is hard. It is counterintuitive. It is against everything that we consider normal in this life. Lord, help us to be broken of what it is that we see as normal and understand that that, Lord, is indeed what is wrong, that you are what is good and beautiful and true and the most satisfying, wonderful moment of each and every one of our lives is the moment that we see you with the utmost satisfaction that will not be able to be described, nor will anyone have any even minuscule particle that will be disappointed in seeing you face to face and hearing those words of well done good and faithful servant and so lord strengthen us with this desire strengthen us with the truth that this does come to those who persevere and lord be gracious to us and give us that strength and it's in jesus name we pray